welcome everybody to our next uh, virtual got it <laughs> meeting in progress uh welcome everybody to another virtual herf uh, with placentia uh paired with lindore spirits uh on the call we've got ricardo from uh, rodrigo from placentia uh who looks after the european marketplace uh roy summer from davidoff and also murray from lindores so i'll pass over to roy and uh uh, thank you for everyone for joining once again. Great, thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, I think it's this, uh, at least at the last virtual herb which uh, which we're doing for uh, this year. So it's good to have you to have you here. Um, it gets a lot colder and a lot darker early on, so it's a good excuse to uh, to smoke a cigar and have a have a nice dram. So um, for those of you who bought the uh, the sampling pack, so you will have had uh, three cigars. Um, it's up to you which one you smoke, really. You know, it depends on your, on your flavor profile. I think the lightest one will be the Reserve Original. Uh, a bit more medium, fuller flavor will be the Almada Fuego, the Panatella. And the strongest one will be the Almada Fuerte Robusto. I think we'll start with, uh, with Rodrigo, just as a quick introduction. If you can tell us a little bit more about yourself, for those who don't know you, uh, where are you, what do you do, and how did you get into the position you are now? Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you, Roy. And thank you, Paul, for always organizing these uh, wonderful events where consumers and aficionados and uh, people who enjoy the good things of all life um, are able to understand and to, to learn a bit more about what we do. Um, my name is Rodrigo Medina. I'm uh, live right now from Barcelona. I'm from Nicaragua. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, the Placencia brands in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. So I'm, I'm the person responsible for developing the business for the family Placencia in this uh, part of the world. So I started with the project actually now was my sixth uh, year anniversary uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and I'm helping the family to uh, develop the business of their own brands. Um, Placencia uh, is known for three things. One is uh, the raw uh, material, the raw tobacco business, also making cigars for other brands. And we launched recently, uh, six years ago now, uh, our own Placencia brands. So I'm the person responsible for them in uh, all the world, but the Americas. Great, thank you. Then over to Murray. Kind of the same question for you, Murray. Um, where are you? What do you do? And how did you get to where you are? And then maybe a little yeah. bit of the, of the history of, of Lindoris before we- Yeah, sure. Well, well uh, Thank you very much for having me along. Um, if you've already poured a wee dram, I, I, won't, I won't go into the full full history of everything to do with Lindores as we could be here all week as it's a, a real treasure trove for, for heritage and history there. Um, so my name is Murray Stevenson. I'm the UK sales manager and brand ambassador at Lindores Abbey Distillery. Uh, we're situated in Newborough in Fife, a little town in Fife just on the banks of the River Tay. Um, not too far from Perth as our sort of like closest bigger neighbour. Um, we are a new young distillery, um, but arguably the richest heritage of any distillery in Scotland at the minute because we are we're built in amongst the ruins of an old 12th century abbey, which is Lindor's Abbey, um, which was established in 1191, uh, but destroyed during the Reformation period in Scotland when Things were changing in Britain between being Catholic and Protestant. Um, you had John Knox and a lot of his friends uh, destroyed a lot of churches and monasteries. And Lindor's Abbey, being a very large and powerful abbey of its time, um, actually got destroyed twice. They weren't quite happy with the first time they did it. Um, so for the last 500 years or so, it's been the abbey's just been a ruin. It's all overgrown with uh, ivy and like it's, it's an overgrown ruin, like classic what you imagine a ruined structure to be um, like a lot of the, the sort of like beautiful sort of archways and things still exist uh, but it is essentially just a, a ruined monastery and it has been just part of Lindor's Abbey farm for about the last half a millennium really um, until about 30 years ago um, a gentleman came knocking at the farmhouse door one day and asked if he could have a look around the back garden of, of the farm which belonged to the Mackenzie Smith family and still does uh, and this gentleman said, can I have a look around your back garden? And it was Drew's dad, Ken, who was there at the time. And he was like, yeah, sure. Like, bash on, have a, like, have a, have a time going, like, mind your feet. The bull was in that area yesterday. So watch where you're stand standing. 
Uh, and this gentleman um, had a look around the abbey. He was watched from the window and he, he was like listening to the rocks and took a few pictures and uh, like took a few notes and then he left and he never said anything. Uh, and about six months later, there was a, a signed book sent to the farmhouse, uh, a beautiful book uh, entitled Scotland and its Whiskies. Uh, and it was uh, a book from the late great beer and whiskey writer, Michael Jackson. And it was himself who had come to the Abbey Ruins that day to walk around uh, Drew's back garden. And he said, thank you very much, Ken, for letting me walk around your back garden. Turn to page 127. Uh, and in that part of the book, it, was, it had a nice picture of the Abbey Ruins. And it said, for the whiskey lover, it is a pilgrimage. And the family were kind of like, what is this guy talking about? We're featuring in a whiskey book. It's saying it's about a, a pilgrimage for whiskey lovers. And there's a picture of our back garden. And what it was, was Jackson was doing a bit of research into a fairly recent discovery at the time, which when somebody had translated old tax records called the Exchequer's Roll, it was the tax records of the king, which is now kept in a museum. And then about 30 yards of parchment that this person was translating from Latin into English, buried right in the middle, was one little sentence that read, to, in 1494, to Brother John Corr, eight balls of malt wherewith to make aquavitae for the king. Um, aquavitae being the Latin for water of life, which we now call, which we later called Ushkabe or Ushkaba, and we now call that spirit whiskey. So this tax record of 1494 to Friar John Corr of Lindor's Abbey is the earliest written reference to Scotch whiskey production. Um, and it's through that sort of history and that little tiny bit of that little tax record, that little snippet of history there, it became a dream of Drew um, to bring back distilling to such an important place. Um, and it took about it took over 20 years for that dream to become realized. And we now have a fantastic single malt whiskey distillery built in amongst the ruins of Lindor's Abbey. And we have just launched our very first uh, general release single malt whiskey that just came out in the summer. So we're very much entering that next stage of the journey now. So that's um, kind of, in a nutshell, really, the, the full like half a millennium or the last 1,200 years of Lindor's Abbey uh, all wrapped up there into one, onto one quick burst. So we could, we could go into all sorts of details, really, about the full history of it all. But that's us kind of now entering that next stage of the journey that we have had spirit aging for over three years now because it's the legality in Scotland for whiskey to be aged for a minimum of three years in one day. So our whiskey became technically became of age in December last year. And like I said, we just released our first malt, um, which was released on the 2nd of July, which is our Lindor's MCDX CIV, which is in Roman numerals, 1494. Um, in case anybody was trying to brush up on their Latin or their Roman numerals there earlier on, that's, that's what that stands for. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll let you carry on with the conversation and we can go into more detail about the flavour and things like that in a wee bit. So. Perfect, thank you. Um, we'll go back to uh, Rodrigo for a second. Um, Rodrigo, for those people who, um, who know a bit about Placentia, but maybe not uh, full history of Placentia, can you kind of give us a breakdown of, of where it all started and what happened in the meantime before they kind of settled where they are now? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and that's a great question. I, I thought we had a long history, but now uh, listening to Murray, <laughs> we have a very short history in comparison to uh, no, to, to their story. But you know, we are from the New World, so we have a, 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 a shorter uh, history than they do here in, in Europe and the, in the UK as well. The family uh, Placencia originally, originally uh, came from the Canary Islands uh, to Cuba and started growing tobacco in 1865. So if you have a look at the long history of, of tobaccos and, and cigars, if you can call it cigars, uh, you know, uh, in 1492, uh, the trade started uh, between Cuba and, and Spain and, and the Cuban cigars, of course, you know, were, were the only ones then. Uh, but if you take history, we are the longest standing family um, working with tobacco and cigars. We established uh, the business and we started in, in 1865. So the first generation then of Placencias uh, started in the area of San Luis in, in, uh, in Cuba, which is the most renowned region of tobacco in, in, in the islands. From uh, Cuba, 
we moved to Nicaragua because of the uh, uh, the Cuban Revolution. Uh, the government took all of the land from, from the family and other families, and they found uh, Nicaragua, my country, to be a great place uh, to grow tobacco because the uh, let's say the climatology is very similar to the to the uh, to Cuba because we are a tropical country, very close. Uh, to Cuba geographically, but um, I think the big difference about Nicaragua and, and the um, the characteristic that brings up a lot of the tobacco is that we are um, a country which is surrounded both by water and volcanoes, which uh, gives a certain characteristic to the tobacco. You know, the volcanic earth is really rich uh, in nutrients, so that's why you know, the tobacco grows uh, very well in Nicaragua. So from Cuba, we moved to Nicaragua, and then yet again in 79, we had another revolution. So the family um, had to move to Honduras where they continue on uh, with growing tobacco. Uh, today, we are operating uh, in the, the two countries. Uh, we grow tobacco in Nicaragua and Honduras. Um, and in the late 80s, beginning of the 90s, we started producing cigars for other brands. So in the beginning of the history of making cigars and rolling cigars, we made cigars for others. Today, we are producing about 42 million cigars for other brands. Uh, and six years ago, like I said in the beginning of my introduction, we launched the brand Placencia uh, to the markets. And the concept is, uh, let's say, rather simple. Uh, it's just using the best raw material of tobaccos that we have in the region uh, and selecting the best artists that we have to roll the Placencia cigars. Um, and if you take this simple concept into perspective, you know, we are the biggest grower of tobacco in the region and also one of the biggest producers of cigars in the region. So taking the best of the best, both in raw materials and, and also when it comes to manufacturing, to, to expertise of the hands, we are trying to deliver the, the, you know, a higher level of quality when it comes to tobaccos and also in, in construction. So that's a, a bit of the history of the family and patients as well. Your mic is off. Uh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned about the, the different regions of um, of Nicaragua. Can you kind of explain a little bit about the difference between um, Estelie, Jalapa, Condega, and Ometepe? What what the different souls do to the tobacco? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, one um, great advantage about Nicaragua is that we are a small country, but inside the small country of Nicaragua, we had we have different terroir. So each terroir that we have, a very specific region has its own characteristic uh, that helps us to create great blends. Uh, for example, SLE, where we have the headquarters of the, of the company and where the family lives, you find that uh, these spicy and leathery notes that we use in some of our blends. Then in Jalapa, that's a Jalapa Valley, that's in the northern uh, part of the country at a higher altitude, which has a lot of cloudiness naturally. So that's where we grow a lot of the wrappers. Uh, and pretty much all of the wrappers that we use in the lines come from Jalapa. And this uh, terroir gives us uh, this sweetness uh, characteristic. Then we have Condega, which is a very noble soil that is very used to, we used it to balance uh, a lot of the blends. And then we have Condega uh, as well, uh, that a lot of the mineral notes uh, we take up from, from this region. Plus the Ometepe, which for me is the most special terroir, which is an island inside the big lake of Nicaragua, where we get, uh, generally speaking, the, the fruity notes. So, so all together, we use this different terroirs to create the blends that we have. But another or the biggest advantage that we have, or one of the biggest is that inside these terroirs, we have microclimates, micro terroirs that the family is using and developing to create uh, you know, the blends that, that we do. Um, as you might know from perhaps some, from, from the wine regions, you know, within the big terroirs, we have very specific micro terroirs that uh, create and make this great wine. So that goes the same for, for Placencia. You know, we're blessed to have access to these Great terroirs and great tobaccos. Good. Um, let's start uh, talking about um, one of the cigars in the uh, in, in the pack, uh, the Reserve Original, which is the uh, the only 100% certified organic cigar in the world. Um, how did that process go, and how did the idea come about? Well, the idea started with um, Nestor Junior. So he's the um, the CEO of the company and the fifth generation already. He has. Um, he has um, two, two sons and two daughters who will continue on the, the, the craft and the passion for tobacco, but he's the, the person in charge. He's uh, my age, and he's a very passionate, curious man, uh, and also very romantic. So 
20 years ago, and about 20 years ago, he played and toyed with the idea of how cigars taste right in the beginning, you know, in the beginning of time when, or, um, or, or, uh, no, or indigenous people in Nicaragua, in the Americas, you know, used to uh, put together the tobacco leaves as a ritual to, to talk and to communicate with the gods. So he had this, um, this seed planted in his head. So he developed in the university studies um, how to grow organic tobacco. So that's how the idea started. So today we have um, tobaccos organically 100% in the three terroirs, so that's Esteli, um, Jalapa, and recently Condega, that Condega we use him for the first time in the year of the tiger, which will be the latest release that will present in the UK at the end of the year. Um, so that's the, the romantic idea behind the organic tobacco, but also I think there's a practical idea behind it. Also, Nestor, Andres, and his family are very sensitive uh, when it comes to uh, the environment, to the earth, to the water. And we found that growing tobacco organically is the best way of taking care of the, the earth and the water that has given the family so much. So it has kind of uh, two sides, you know, the romantic and let's say the practical looking into the future. So what makes it, uh, what different processes are there that makes it organic? You know, you obviously don't use any pesticides, you don't use any um, other kind of chemicals. So what, what is it you do use to- Co Correct, correct. To uh, it, and... No, it's, it's, let's say it's, a, it's a simple process and it's going back, in, uh, going back to the, the word simple, but also complex. I think the, the good things in life are very simple, but they have a process. So that means uh, simply that everything that we use both to protect and to feed the tobacco plant is natural. So we use uh, compost to, to feed the plant. Uh, we, we are using compost from uh, a very specific worm that we imported from California. Uh, we have found that this compost gives the best nutrients to the earth and to the plant. So the plant grows very strongly. And then to protect the plant, uh, we don't use any artificial chemicals. We are using chem chemicals to, to protect the plant. Everything that we use is natural. We plant uh, some flowers around the fields. We use the tool called Ticoderma. We use also neem tree oil to protect the plant from, from the pests, uh, from the insects. So let's say it's a, it's a very simple process, uh, but it's the process that we have found um, uh, to, and to learn to do, to get the full essence and flavor for, from the earth in Jalapa, in Esteli, and Condega now. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit of whiskey. Murray, uh, I think most people have uh, by now uh, tried a bit of the uh, Lendoris uh, whiskey. So what should, uh, what should they be picking up out of, in terms of flavor, in terms of the nose? Yeah, sure. So um, hopefully like what your initial kind of feelings for it would be, would be if you're getting it on the nose, you're, you're, you're smelling, it, it's an odd thing to say, but you, you, you're, you're smelling the texture of it straight away. It smells creamy. Um, it's not, doesn't smell creamy in the sense that it smells like cream, but it smells like that. You can, even on the nose, you can get that soft, like quite luxurious texture to it. So it feels, and then you should, it's, it's quite sweet, but, but not too sugary sweet. There's lots of, um, lots of orchard fruits. They are quite reminiscent of like sort of toffee apple almost on the nose is what you're getting there. It's nice and light. Um, but plenty of complexion there. So it's not, it, it doesn't just disappear straight away. It's got like a really nice uh, sort of juicy fruit note. And um, what's happening there is we've, we've got one of the longest fermentation processes in the industry, um, which when I say fermentation, it's the, the, the point of the, the process where it's that the beer making aspect of it really. So we get all of our barley from, uh, it's 100% Fife barley, which is like where we are from. So geographically, uh, we are a, a lowland distillery, um, which means that we are part of the, the lowland region. We are just on the on the banks of the River Tay, and we actually distill just three metres into the lowlands. So we're just almost a highland distillery, but we are, are, are still houses three metres into the lowlands. Um, so we're using fantastic uh, local Fife barley, and for the last year or so now, it's been all of the barley's come from within half a mile of the distillery uh, from two, our two neighboring farms. So you can literally reach over the abbey walls and touch the fields and touch the barley where it's growing. And uh, we did this because we wanted to, like, you know, try and bring it all as much 
like close to the distillery as possible. Um, and it also really ties into it would have been part of the same grounds that the monks were farming um, when it was part of the Abbey estate all those years ago. So it's trying to like farm the, the barley from the same fields that the monks would have been using too. Uh, but also as a sustainability aspect of it, it's really important to us to be getting it as close as we can um, to, from, this, from where the distillery is to where we get our barley from. Um, but getting that really nice sort of creamy note on the nose before you even taste it, a lot of that is due to the, our, like I said, there are long fermentation process. So that beer making aspect there is one of the longest in the industry of, it's of 119 hours. So to put that into perspective, industry standard is about 50 to 60 hours. Anything over 48 hours for, for the fermentation, the, the, the yeast has done its full job there. So it's already, it's converted all of the sugars into alcohol. And in terms of a financial point of view, you would want to try and keep that as short as possible because you can start distilling from that. But we are very much about the quality over the quantity and definitely over the speed of what we're doing. So we ferment for 119 hours. So it's like almost double industry standard there. And that's giving us those really ripe, juicy fruit notes in that sort of beer making process aspect of it. And um, so right on the cusp where it would almost start to go sour. We don't want sour flavors, obviously. So we stop our fermentation just at those really, really ripe, juicy fruit notes. And that will follow through the, the whole distillation process into the flavors for the whiskey. Um, we distill in a very, uh, quite a unique way which is, it's not triple distillation, it's double distillation that we do, but we have one wash still, one large wash still, and two smaller sister spirit stills. And the two sister spirit stills are doing the job of one large spirit still. So they get fed from the same low wines and fence tank, they get charged at the same time, uh, and they're, they're fed at the same time, and we, we take the cut of both. So the point in having the two smaller stills um, is that it gives you double the copper contact that you would get from the one still, and we can distill a much gentler heat, much um, like a much like a much slower pace really to the distillation process that's there. So we can we can heat them like more gently, and it can be run more slowly. So it'll give us a much lighter, um, softer spirit that's coming across. And what this is allowing us to do is this is allowing us to have a, a spirit coming off the still that's of very very high quality before it's even touched the barrel. So what comes off is what's called is this kind of clear spirit here that's called new make spirit, and this spirit here was actually awarded uh, last year from the World Whiskey Awards as the the best quality new make spirit in Scotland. So for us, as a young small independent distillery, before we'd even released our first whiskey, people were associating with what we were doing with very high quality and that patience of what we were doing and focus and attention on the high quality style of spirit was paying off dividends and now and it's a very drinkable product before you even put it into casks which not there's not every distillery can say that not everybody everybody would want you to drink their new make spirit whereas our new make spirit before it's even been in uh, aged is, is very palatable it's very fruity very creamy uh, and really like easy to drink even at 63 and a half percent and so you have to treat it as such obviously if you're drinking it like that and um, but it's very easy to drink so this is what our new make spirit, our award-winning spirit, has then been aged in a combination of our three core casks, which is X uh, bourbon, X Oloroso sherry, and STR red wine barriques. Uh, it's what gives you the, the combination of the three casks that is a batting that makes up our, our like our, our core single malt spirit, which is the NCD at CIB. So again, on the nose, nice and sweet. Uh, if you're going in for a little taste, again, just really, really juicy, really easy. Um, it's doesn't it's 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 an easy enough whiskey to introduce somebody to whiskey for the first time and it have no aggressive notes whatsoever. There's no peak there and there's no sort of off notes. There's no sharpness to it at all. Even for a young spirit, when this is going into blind tastings, it's it's really unbelievable to to think that it's only three and a half years old. Uh, it sits shoulder to shoulder quite comfortably with spirits that are twice or three times its age. And that's just because it's got that really nice sort of gentle fruit forward creaminess to it. It's, it's without encouraging anybody to drink more than they should, because you've got to be careful with how you word things in the alcohol game these days, obviously. Uh, I would describe it as a very sessionable dram. That's not me saying get on a session uh, and get it down you, but it's one that you can get some whiskies that come out the cupboard 
or come out of the cabinet once or twice a year. They're really bold in flavors. And you might say, oh, I'll have just one or two of those. Whereas you get a, a dram like this uh, as our as our classic from Lindor's and it's it's very quaffable, if that makes sense. It's just, you can take the lid off with a group of friends and you can very much just keep pouring of an evening and enjoy it. And it's just, it's got, for, for a seasoned malt drinker, it's got enough complexity there to really bring you back in for a lot more, but it's nice and gentle and just, just super easy to drink, nice and juicy. So yeah, cheers, Slange. Cheers. Um, can you tell us a bit more about uh, the master blender? For, from Lindor's, yes. Yeah. So we, we are, we're a small independent distillery. So a lot of the, everybody who works at the distillery has, has all, apart from Gary Haggart, who is our distillery manager, who is a fantastic um, distillery manager at X Crag and More, um, everybody else who kind of works at the distillery has, has come into the distillery um, in, a, in a different format than what they've probably landed in now. Um, we, most of the staff come from the local area a lot of the, the, the people working in the actual still house making the spirit themselves had come in originally as working front of house, doing like serving, working in the bar or coming in as gardeners, things like that. We have a, a big abbey grounds kind of thing to cut grass for. And so people came in with all lots of different aspects of what their original job was. And Drew and Helen and Gary are, have just been very good at being able to see passion in people and see determination in what they want to do and there's been fantastic training giving to people to to come there so Lorena um is from Chile and she is our she is what we would call our blender she's definitely on her way to being a master blender for sure um, I'm not too sure what the ins and outs of somebody becoming being a blender to a master blender or how that becomes but I would definitely say that Lorena is a master blender for sure so Lorena um she came from a background of food science in Chile, and she then came over uh, with her family who were, who, was, who were working in Scotland. And Lorena started off as uh, working in the kitchen uh, for events at Lindor's, and she's a fantastic cook. Um, but Drew, um, our distillery founder and owner, would often joke with Lorena that she was a fantastic cook, but perhaps didn't have the background of staple Scottish meals of stovies and mince and tatties in that sort of sense. So she was, she was, she was uh, too good to be, to be wasted just in the kitchen. And like she put her food science degree to very good use. And she established a lot of the, like the practices of um, bringing together like a sensory panel and things for that. And from, from day one, really, she's kind of taken on the, the mantle of, the skill set that was very much demanded of a blender and work closely with Gary, our facility manager, to become our, our blender for Lindor's. And she's got an incredible nose, incredible palate, and she's picked together some casks and blended them together nicely to give us what has been one of the like, best received young malts in the market of the last couple of years, I think. So, yeah, credit to Lorena for that, for sure. So it's the two of them. So Lorena and, uh, and Gary, are those the people who who decide on everything, on the fermentation process, on the, the barrel aging or? Yeah, well, we had, um, in the early days of, of Lindor's, we had the, I'm, I'm about to say the term late great again, not everybody that works with Lindor's in any aspect has passed away. So I, it's not like a, a, a jinx or anything to work with Lindor's, but um, we had the fantastic and highly esteemed um, Dr. Jim Swan, who was the lead consultant on the build of Lindor's, um, who sadly he passed away just before we started the actual distilling aspect of it. So in normal circumstances, um, Dr. Jim Swan would have helped us, held us by the hand really as we, uh, as we went into the actual spirit production and like all of his kind of relationships he built with um, bodegas and Cooperages all across the world um, really like forged those relationships with us going forward. And that's what's given us access to some of the, the, the finest fermentation vessels, that the uh, maturation vessels, sorry, that the industry has to offer. And um, so we, we fell into some 
incredibly good quality casks. And that comes down a lot to the relationships that were built there with Dr. Jim Swan in the early days. And he had a, an idea of what we should do to make the, the type of spirit that Lindor's is making um, of uh, a spirit that will mature um, quickly, but also very well over long periods of time. So I'm hoping that what we're doing is, is really testament to what he had planned um, before, like in the early days. And then it, it very much does go down to the skill set of Gary Haggart and his team at the distillery to take this idea from such a highly esteemed person in the industry and then have to mold it into to do it themselves. So the, the longer fermentation was very much came from Gary and um, like playing around with the spirit when it f first started, he, he wanted to, to get some extra fruitiness and things from it. So he, he increased the length of time for the fermentations. And again, that's not something that you can, you can give to every distillery owner and say, that's what we're going to do. We're going to increase these times because the, that, that fermentation time there is very much the bottleneck for the, the, the whole process because you can only make so much at one time before you put it into casks and increasing that length of time there doesn't bode well with a bank manager so to speak but again very much goes down to the fact that we want to make the best possible spirit we can and that hopefully is what people are agreeing with now with the it's setting a new benchmark i think for for young for young whiskey really and the type of quality it can be at such a young age um, ourselves and a lot of other young distilleries are really shaking up the industry as to what you can do with such a young spirit. Uh, and it'll just continue to get better, I think, as it gets older. But um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a team effort all the time. Um, when we, when we're, we do, like, we all, like a large amount of the team all get sent sort of five or six samples at a time for 10 or 12 different stages. It's very much reminiscent of like the, the Euros or the World Cup kind of thing you pick your winner of each round and it, it goes on to the next one and it plays against the winner of that round and until you get to two or three that have just been outright winners for for so long that it then gets decided between one two or three blends um of of what your single malt will be and i was very fortunate to be part of that sensory panel doing that and it's something that i learned loads from and was uh, was a really exciting thing to be part of to watch at the the transformation of a young new make spirit and follow that into what would be our, our first single malt whiskey and everybody kind of coming to terms with using a, a turn of phrase that we never we never meant to coin but you know when you were trying things it was it, it wasn't just is it balanced how does it taste it was does it taste Lindor's enough? You know, everybody was kind of coming to that conclusion that some drams tasted more Lindor's than others, and it just felt right. And that, that's how we got to the conclusion of what we would release for our first single malt. So hopefully we did our job okay. <laughs> and uh, um, hopefully what you've got in the glass is, is something that you feel is also is, is very, very tasty, very good quality. So. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the bottle design because they're quite uh, quite unique. Absolutely, yeah. So it's you know it, it is something truly unique um, for what you're what you're seeing on the shelf uh, next to a lot of traditional bottles for sure. Um, the the shape came from was inspired by a lot of the masonry work that was excavated from the abbey ruins during the build of the distillery, and um, they uncovered these beautiful twelfth century stone columns that had this um, stunning sort of fluted design in the bottle. And that's what was a big part of the inspiration for the shape. Um, it was, the final design was done by um, a company called Stranger and Stranger, who are, again, just a fantastic company to, to be working with for glass design. They, you'll, you'll recognize a lot of their, their bottle designs in the market these days um, for other people like um, Harris Gin, for example, you know, any, any eye-catching, like truly eye-catching bottles that be coming on uh, the market of recent. A lot of it is coming from the guys at Stranger and Stranger. They're just a, a cracking team. And so, yeah, we we originally started out with uh, that shape of the bottle for our Aquavitae bottle, um, which is was some uh, a route that we went down something very different than I'd say. What I was about to say traditional there, but it's probably not traditional. It's like a modern tradition, if that makes sense. 
of, of distilleries releasing gin or vodka in that sort of low time period as they're waiting patiently for their whiskey to age. Um, we wanted to try something different and go down a different path rather than releasing gin. Um, so what we did was we keep back some of our um, very good quality new mix spirit, which 99.9% .9 of it would go into cast to become our whiskey. Uh, but we keep a little bit of it back unaged and it goes in a different route. And it, instead of putting it into cast to age, we put it into a stainless steel vat with botanicals, spices and fruits um, to, be, to create this very unique style spirit drink that we call our aqua vitae. And it's, it's actually more familiar to what the monks would have been making in the early days of distillation because they didn't know about maturation and they didn't know what a cask did. Um, that would have come about accidentally over different periods of time from storage or transportation. So to make, uh, if you can imagine distillation process 500 years ago uh, in quite primitive stills, um, the, the spirit would have been very harsh and like to make it a little bit more palatable, especially if it was being sold to a royal household like the tax record of going to King James IV, the monks would be adding in botanicals, spices and fruits to that malt spirit to make it more palatable. And um, we don't obviously do that with our whiskey because the laws for making whiskey is you can only make it with um, three ingredients of uh, water, yeast and barley. Um, but because of those, when those laws were introduced, people stopped making whiskey and those older methods of adding botanicals, spices and fruits to it. And it's still familiar, obviously, in industries like gin or vermouths. Um, but in the malt whiskey game, it just stopped happening. So we wanted to bring something back from a bygone age, really, for and bring it up to date for a modern palate and make it nice and versatile for mixing as well, with no stigma attached to it. Nobody using words like blasphemy or sacrilege or saying, what would your grandfather think you'd be turning in his grave if he saw you adding that to your whiskey? And um, so we wanted to have a, a spirit that had was a very guilt free approach to having in a different atmosphere than would perhaps be traditional in Scotland or UK or in many parts of the world for having for a malt. Whereas the industry is changing a lot, um, but we wanted to kind of help it on its way a little bit with a, a unique style spirit drink. So the Aqua Vita is kind of like a middle ground between whiskey, gin and spice rum, if that makes sense to anybody. It sounds a bit, it sounds a bit crazy, but it's got all the like the kind of depth of character of a malt spirit, but more fruity, more spicy, more herbaceous. Um, but it's a lot more three dimensional than a, than a gin because it's made with a young malt spirit instead of a neutral grain spirit. Um, so yeah, so when, when we brought that out, we wanted to have a, a bottle that was kind of capturing that whole story of Lindor's really and the, the darker sort of brown bottle and the, the sort of rip design and things that's on it there is, is has that kind of monks and monastery apothecary kind of feel to the product. but we also, when we were bringing out our first whiskey, we wanted to, you know, to show off the color of it as well. You know, we're, we're proud to have a beautiful colored whiskey. It's non-chill filtered. It's no, ca no caramel coloring or anything added. So we decided to keep that same shape of the bottle and it become quite an iconic Lindor's bottle shape, but have it as clear glass so people could, can see what's inside. So. Especially the uh, aqua vita bottle, it, it looks a bit of like an uh, apocatari, uh, what they used to use uh, in, in those kind of places. Yeah. Uh, the apocatari, yeah, what you have now in the, in the distillery as well, no? Say again, that for, what was that again, sorry, you? Apothecary. Apothecary, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We have a, we have a, a beautiful little oh, it's apothecary, my strange accent. apothecary in the room, yeah, for sure. It's so. my strange Dutch accent. Must be yeah, yeah, no, 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 it's, it's fine. Um, no, yeah, so it's... I, I, I guess it's going back to its kind of roots. Um, whiskey, I guess, could very much still be described as a medicinal product in many ways. Um, I'm sure lots of us take it to, to treat all sorts of ailments. Yeah, absolutely, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but its, it's original format um, would very much have been used for medicinal use, for surgical use. Before it was even being consumed, it was used for, like, cleaning of like of everything really and there's there, there's old texts from centuries gone by of all the different things that aqua vitae or the water of life was said to cure everything from headaches to piles to melancholy it was uh 
it was a wondrous liquid to, to cure everything. So, uh, and perhaps to this day, it definitely still kills a bit melancholy for sure. <laughs> so. Let's just switch back to uh, Rodrigo for a bit, and then we'll come back to you later, Murray, to talk a little yeah, bit about uh, the future of, uh, of Lindoris and what we can expect in the years coming. Um, but yeah, as, uh, as Murray just mentioned, you now the, the aqua vita is a bit spicy and a bit fruity. I think that kind of leans in nicely to, to the Alma de Fuego, which kind of has a bit more of these characteristics. Um, you already mentioned that, uh, that most of the tobacco comes from the island of Ometepe. So what else is, is special about the Alma de Fuego? Yeah, when Harry was describing that, uh, that, that whiskey, I thought about, about Alma, Alma, Alma del Fuego. Alma del Fuego, the, um, Alma means soul uh, in Spanish, and Fuego means fire. Uh, the island of Ometepe is a very volcanic island. Uh, like you said, 80% uh, of the tobaccos from that cigar come from the island of Ometepe. Just the wrapper is from Jalapa. Uh, as I told you before, Jalapa, uh, we use it as wrappers, and they bring the sweetness. But Ometepe is a very unique um, uh, place on earth because it's a beautiful island uh, inside the big lake of Nicaragua that's surrounded by, by, by fresh water. And also in the island, um, farmers also grow a lot of, um, a lot of fruits. So that's uh, terroir also, the, the volcanic plus the fruits being grown in the island transpire into the tobacco from, from, from these plants. So you get a lot of uh, fruity flavors, fruity aromas uh, from, from that island. And also it's a very a specific to us because very few families grow tobacco in this island. So it's a very exclusive uh, tobacco, very unique uh, and very special to us. Um, so I think you have the Panatella right in the package, Roy? Yeah. So that, uh, that, that, that uh, Vitola for me is the, the, my favorite uh, bolt. I love the beautiful shape of the Panatella, but also you can uh, taste, uh, I think, more of the sweetness that I'm talking about from the island of Omitep in this, in this Vitola. So this was kind of the, um, the newest cigar you guys released from uh, from the Alma line after the before the 601, really. Um, so how how did the idea come about for the Alma de Fuego? Well, uh, Ometepe, like I said, is a very unique uh, terroir in, in Nicaragua, and only us and another family are growing are growing tobacco there. When we thought um, about the the Alma series, so we have the Alma Fuerte, which also is in the in the package. We have Alma del Campo, Soul of the Fields, and uh, we have Fuego, and then another line thought about the future. The the terroir that express, let's say, the fire of Nicaragua, the volcanic earth, uh, is the Fuego, and Fuego uh, for us in volcanic is the island of Ometepe. So everything just links together into this uh, beautiful plant. Uh, it has to be Ometepe, it has to be volcanic, it has to be fire, it has to be fruity. So that's, uh, that's where the idea comes from. Okay. Um, so besides uh, growing tobacco in, in Nicaragua, um, you guys also grow tobacco in, in Honduras. So what's the difference between um, kind of the climate or the soil in Honduras? Because it's, I would imagine it's close to Dali uh, compared to, to Esteli and Jalapa and Contega. Yeah, yeah, Honduras is uh, our neighboring country in the north from, from Nicaragua, and uh, some of the, um, especially the Hamasan Valley and the Jalapa Valley, they have a lot of similarities uh, when it comes to flavors, but then uh, Honduras is another different terroir that, that, that we use in some of the plants. We have a plant uh, of Nicaraguan and Honduran tobacco on the cosecha 146 um, that it's uh, in the market, and we're launching a new um, cosecha, with the 149, which is 100% tobacco from Honduras. Uh, Honduras doesn't have, let's say, the, um, the not, not the reputation, but the, 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 the trendiness that Nicaragua has at the moment, but it's amazing tobacco as well. In all the regions of Honduras, uh, all together, we can create great blends, and uh, the new Cosecha 149 will be a, a perfect example of the quality of tobacco from Honduras. What can you tell us about the blend of the 149? What can we expect? What can we expect? Um, so it should be in the market uh, in the UK, I think towards the next month. So I think in December you'll be able to, to enjoy it. Uh, it's, a, it's a blend that I tried in my last trip to Honduras, which was before the pandemic two years ago. Uh, it's middle, middle, middle to fuller blends, uh, very aromatic, uh, some fruity, some creaminess into it, and some light chocolate as well. So I think that's what you can expect from this plant. Um, cosecha in Spanish means harvest, and 149 means that this is the 149 harvest from the family. So we have selected the best tobaccos from this harvest uh, in, in Honduras. 
So I believe that this, this what you can expect. It's a limited uh, edition. It's vintage tobacco. So that means it's a harvest from 2014. Um, so it's about seven to eight years um, aging you know, on that on that blend. So we hope that the uh, the aficionados who are enjoying some of the lines in Pacencia in the UK also will enjoy this uh, new one for nine. I just put a picture up of the box in the chat box so people already can uh, have a, a visual preview of, of, of what to expect. Um, I think it's yeah, it, it's, it's a stunning looking cigar um, and, and, and nice presentation, and nice and dark. So yeah, definitely looking forward to, to that. Um, how was the, um, the COVID period for, for, for you guys as a cigar producer kind of, and how did it change over the stages of of COVID. I, I, well, it's, it's been um, it's been um, like like anywhere in the world. It's been a difficult uh, time uh, for for everybody, and also in Nicaragua was an exception. Um, I think that the biggest challenge for us uh, coming from a third world country is that we don't have the structure of the, that they do in Europe. You know, when it comes to the health services, so. Uh, we had to, let's say, put together a plan in, in the in the factory, which replicated uh, uh, the uh, the safety measurements that uh, you know, they were taking in the U.S. And, and and also in Europe. So we had to put everything to, everything together so we can keep you know, our people working safe. Uh, on top of that, you know, logistically, it's been difficult for us to ship out the cigars from Nicaragua. Prices of uh, logistics and also shipping out has increased both uh, by air and by sea freight. Um, having access to vaccines has been difficult also, so we are trying to provide vaccines uh, to, 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 to our employees. And altogether, you know, it's been a huge challenge, but also an opportunity. Uh, we have found that uh, us cigar aficionados have had more time to enjoy cigars uh, at home. Um, so we have increased production uh, dramatically. Um, I think the pandemic has given us enough time both to reflect and to enjoy the good things in life. So thank God that the, uh, the aficionados uh, are choosing Placencia as one of the, the favorite bands. But it's been a huge challenge, you know, huge challenge, huge, huge opportunity. But the family of, of Placencia is known um, and one of the one of you know, the, the big pieces of their DNA. It's their resilience. You know, they've been able to overcome a revolution in Cuba and Nicaragua, starting from zero again. This COVID has been yet another challenges. Uh, we are used to challenges of each harvest, you know, the weather conditions are, are changing, so we adapt to that. Um, so it's just another challenge on the history of the Pacencia, but the passion behind growing tobacco, the love we have with the tobacco, and also the commitment that we have with the people in Nicaragua to our employees, you know, is the driving force to create great products for, for our consumers around the world. So you added three new factories during COVID? Yes, sir. We have added, um, in the beginning, you know, the, having more space uh, and having people working um, safer, that was in the intention in the beginning, but also, like I said, uh, the demand for cigars have increased uh, dramatically over the last two years. So we are producing more and more cigars than before. So we have had to add more factories and more production space for workers to work uh, safer. So how many people work for the Placentia family now? So altogether now during the uh, harvest season, 9,000. Um, so say fix all year is about 6,000 people, but altogether it's 9,000 9, people. So we, we are a big company for, for Central America uh, with big responsibilities as well. I think you guys need to update that uh, display in your boardroom at the factory in Esteli. I think uh, the one with the cigars is 6,000 cigars, I think. Yeah, yeah. So you need to update it. Uh, <laughs> to make a, a bigger display. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> For those of you um, who, who might have seen it before, if you ever get the chance to go to the uh, Placentia factory in, uh, in, in Nicaragua, in Esteli, uh, in the boardroom, they've got a, a big display uh, made out of cigars. And um, there's two colored cigars and the black cigars, or the more darker cigars, they write out Placentia. And there's 6,000 cigars in the display, which linked back to the 6,000 employees they had. So now they've got 9,000 employees, so they need to uh, put somebody to work and, uh, and, and make a bigger one. <laughs> and more cigars, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's uh, head back to Murray for a second, before afterwards we talk about the Alma Fuerte. Um, Murray, I, I think uh, you guys have uh, something called the 500 Club. Uh, yeah, so we have, yeah, so it's, we have, it's, it's 
1494 Preservation Society. So a lot, a lot of what we do at Lindores, well, you'll you'll hear that 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 date or that number 1494 quite a lot. And yeah. because because we owe so much to that date, it's the whole reason we we have the distillery there now. And I guess in a many ways, it's the one of the like the reasons we have a Scotch whiskey industry as a whole. Um, like we never we never claim to have invented whiskey. We can imagine that it was happening before that date and um i always think it's perhaps a little bit unromantic for all of our poems and songs and stories we have about our national drink that the earliest reference comes from a tax record but uh it, it is it's a little, a little piece of history that's there and associated so yeah we have um we have our 1494 preservation society and that's a, a sort of a members club really for for lindors and obviously there's there's a number like there's a one member for every number there is so there's only 1494 uh, members and i think we're we only have about 40 memberships left um as once we obviously brought the whiskey out it, it was becoming much more well known to the world that we were doing this so uh, but it's it's a great it's a great thing it's a great little family of people to be part of the part of the distillery to um to go forward with its with the whole future of what we're doing and a lot of the the money from the membership goes towards like the upkeep of the abbey ruins itself and we're obviously not rebuilding the abbey because it's a historical site but we're trying to kind of reintroduce a lot of the ethos of what the monks would have had there um at the abbey so where every member comes and plants their own fruit tree and we're so we'll have some new orchards we have new honey like uh some new hives of honeybees and things like that and a lot of trying to kind of reintroduce a lot of what was there. And one of the really exciting bits that was uncovered during the build of the distillery, uh, it's, it sounds really exciting to uncover things all the time, but I'm sure Drew and Helen um, would tell you it, it's, it becomes quite frustrating when you're trying to build a distillery and you're obviously in, uh, built in amongst such an important place. And so there had to be um, archaeological teams from St Andrews and Edinburgh University, sort of like on site all the time, and they were finding things all the time. That was like this is really exciting. You found another wall, but we want to build the warehouse. So can you stop finding things almost? So, <laughs> but what was a really exciting thing to find was what they believed to when it first was uncovered that it was an old well because um, it was filled with water and it was a, a stone circle that was filled with water. They thought they'd uncovered a medieval well, but once they cleared the water out, it had a, a clay base and it's believed to be the original still site and um, possibly even the original still site for that 1494 reference. So one of the oldest still sites in Europe um, that would be there now at the back of the, the back of the distillery. So we hope to be able to kind of put a nice sort of viewing platform over that because it's still technically an active dig so it doesn't look too attractive with when it's covered in tarpaulins all the time at the minute and um, so part of that preservation society is will be kind of trying to preserve that site for generations to come and hopefully in the next 500 years we still have a a ruined structure that's there uh, and kept looked after a little bit better than it has been for the last 500 years um, but for the next whiskies we have coming out um like sort of like larger general releases that we'll be doing will be a bit of a deconstruction really of the three core casks that we use for the blend of the single malt that is the MCDX CIV. And so the first one is due to be coming out um, very soon will be aged exclusively in bourbon casks. So it will be kind of identifying that bourbon element, that sherry element, and that STR red wine brie element. Uh, so the the first one will be bourbon, and um, second, I'd assume sherry, and third will be that STR. Um, so when I say STR, that um, is means shaved, toasted, and recharred. So it's a uh, again when I was mentioning Jim Swan earlier on, it was a fantastic uh, recipe of a cask um, style to use that was uh, a recipe invented by uh, Jim Swan and uh, Miguel, Miguel Martin from Spain from the the sherry regions of using old red wine casks and shaving off the inside um, the inside layer of the wood, bringing it back to almost virgin oak style wood, but with a little bit of wine penetration left there. So you could, the younger the wood essentially, 
the, the quicker the maturation um, that will take place. Um, so it's leaving a little bit of the wine penetration there. So when you rechar, it's got some of those beautiful wine sugars that are still there, um, but it's giving you a much younger, fresher cask um, to speed up maturation. It's a, it's a really good way for young distilleries like ourselves to um, bring on a little bit early maturity to, to a spirit as well. So, yeah, so there's, there's lots of exciting bits and pieces coming out, but there'll be some market exclusives for single casks, things like that. And just a, a very, very exciting wee distillery to be keeping an eye on, I think. It's, it's going, it, like every day people are discovering it for the first time and falling in love with the history of it there, but also falling in love with the quality of the spirit. And it was a very much a good decision to make to not, obviously the history is a massive part, but there, there could have been a route taken where it was solely about the history and not about the quality of the spirit. And we could have become a, a Greyfriars Bobby or a Loch Ness Monster of a, of a distillery in it. Just been about the ghost of Friar John Carr and all that kind of jazz. But the, the effort that was made to say, you've got this beautiful heritage, you need to really kind of make a, a quality of whiskey that's going to match that heritage. So there was, there's no expense spared in every single aspect of the distillery testimony there of having the best consultants that the world would have there for the original build, the Rolls Royce really of stills from Forsyth is there. And if anybody ever has a chance to visit the distillery, it's, it is a truly humbling little place. It's, you do feel that you're kind of entering somewhere really important. You can still walk around the old Abbey and we have a modern distillery there built very well in tuned with the, the, the history of the path. It all blends in really nicely together. So, um, yeah, looking forward to getting some, some faces, some new faces again from overseas coming to be able to visit now. It's, um, we had our first American tourists back the other day. It's never something that we would have ever thought as being like, oh, that's a, a big step because we always had lots of tourists from all over the world come to visit what is known as the spiritual home of Scotch whiskey. It very much is a pilgrimage spot now. Um, but starting to see people coming from different countries again, it's starting to feel that the world's getting back a little bit to normal because we we very much felt the, the hit of the pandemic just like everybody else did. And um, that's why, we again, we, we hope to be able to support the industry as much as we possibly can. And we, we did that in a way of our very first like general release bottling. We had... Uh, commemorative label bottles that we give entirely to the trade. We could have uh, sold all of those ourselves and taken full advantage of that. They would have sold out on our own channels like overnight pretty much, but we we wanted to kind of give that to the trade and try and encourage people to start going back to their, their local bottle shops as much as possible. I'm not saying that us releasing one bottle solved that whole problem for everyone, but it's it's nice to kind of try and do a little bit if you can and we want to be associated with that independent bottle shop and independent retailer kind of aspect as much. So that's why it's fantastic to be able to, to do these kind of things with Paul and like get to get to be involved yeah. in that scene. Yeah, Murray, like we really appreciate that. And I think the whole industry in terms of the independence outside of the you know grocery or the bigger players to actually have the ability to release those commemorative um, releases because there was a huge demand for it um, as, as with any new releases from new distilleries so really happy to help and support you no cheers yeah Slash, thank you for that yes. so if people would want to uh, visit the distillery uh, okay, you're, you're in and around uh, five so what's the best way of, of, of for people getting there is there accommodation close by people can stay uh, can you just walk in for a tour do they need to book how does it work in normal in, in normal life, it would be uh, you could just walk in. Um, now, I think with anything in tourism, uh, booking ahead is very much advisable because there's there's smaller numbers than on tours than we would have been able to do before. Um, we didn't quite sardine everybody and just put 100 people on a tour or anything, but if people turned up in the day, you would say, yeah, you can jump on, whereas I think we're still limited to about 15 people or so and um, for mixed groups anyway, and um, for tours, things like that. But um, in terms of our location, we are fantastically situated for visiting Scotland in general, really. Uh, we're an hour north of Edinburgh, and um, we're 
20 minutes from Perth, we're 20 minutes from Dundee, we're 25 minutes from St Andrews. You know, we're 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 in a, a fantastic spot to for accessibility to everywhere. Um Perth, just along the road, like I said, is often described as a gateway to the highlands, um, as it be your kind of your last major stop before you start going off in different directions into the highlands there. So if you're visiting anywhere in Scotland, there's a very high chance you're going to to come very close to where we are at Lindores on the way past. And um, Fife in general is is becoming a fantastic little hub for, for new distilleries and for fantastic distilleries. We have our neighbours just along the road in Cooper for Daff Mill. Uh, if you head along to St Andrews area, you've got places like Eden Mill and King's Barns, things like that. And it's we're not we're not quite tussling space side for how many distilleries we've got, but we're we're, we're championing like a new young scene of of lowland distilleries, which is which is great. But it's always been that I've always felt quite sorry for the the lowland whiskey section on a, on any whiskey book in a in a whiskey bar anywhere where you'd have six or seven pages of space side malts or four or five for Highlands, a good couple for Isla, and then you'd get two options at the end of uh, it's not, not even a whole page or a half a page for Lowlands. It would be quite often one or two options from Glen Kinchy and one or two op options from Ockentoshin. Whereas I think now the one of the most exciting regions of Scotch whisky at the minute is the Lowlands. And there's, there's so much fantastic quality whisky being produced. And it, it's an area, Fife especially, is an area for farmland that's that is really like sort of fueled like a lot of the, the the barley that's gone into like single malts from all regions all over the place um like for for many years in the past and now to be able to get local fife barley to produce for local fife distilleries is is really class so there is and um, we are not as remote as going to like a little island or something like that so we're very accessible in that sense but uh we are still remote enough that there's not a major train station or anything in the in the town but it's very easy, easy enough to act very easy to access if you have a car by train or bus coming to perth from edinburgh is is simple and then a short journey from perth so or from st Anne, from cooper or from dundee that kind of thing so easy easy to get to and definitely worthwhile coming it's a it's a fantastic visit and we get people from coming to to visit the distillery who have been to hundreds of um, well over a hundred distilleries. We uh, we have people from from Germany especially who seem to um, to bag distillery tours like people would bag Monroe's or uh, <laughs> like like other other kind of like things that they, like people. Some people collect football cards or baseball cards or some people collect distillery tours by the scenes of things. And we we have people that who have done several distillery tours and they walk away from Lindor's feeling like they've had a very unique style of distillery tour, distillery experience, because there's, it's almost like half a museum, half a distillery. So a lot of it is to do with the history of the Abbey itself and the history of whiskey as a whole, and not just about our own whiskey production, but like a real sense of history that goes with it all. So it's, uh, even though I've been working there for a few years, every time you go, you catch it on a good day. And the way the sun's shining onto the still house from the Abbey ruins, it's, it's a pretty whimsical little place. <laughs> I had a tasting last week with uh, uh, the Isle of Ryan mm -hmm. distillery, which is a bit more complicated to get to, I believe. For sure. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think of the cigar, Marie? Yeah, it's, it's, away? it's delicious. Yeah, I'm on the, the white label there. Oh, and it's, it's fantastic. It's nice. I think it's nice and... Um, it was just described as yourselves as maybe a little lighter than the other two, um, and I think it. I think for the for the style of whiskey that we've got there as well, it's it, it's a nice light whiskey to go with it too. So sometimes you know you, you'll I'd imagine you get different cigars that would pair nicely with things that are really robust and really peated and things like that. Whereas this one seems to be really nice with the the flavors that are in our single malt there of those kind of more sort of like lighter sort of honey and heathery kind of notes that are coming through. So. Perfect. I just had uh, one of your friends message me. Yeah. Andrew Lenny. Yeah, he, he, he said, uh, I told him earlier on because I was uh, I was hunting high and low for a cigar cutter. And so yeah, I, yeah. Gave, I gave Andy a shout because he always has one in his back pocket. So 
Um, yeah, and Andrew was the he, Andrew and I both worked together at Lindor's um, from the start, really. Uh, and he now he works with Victor Cairn and Dalmore. Yeah. Um, so I think he's he's done some tastings with yourself right. in the yes. past with that. So so yeah, it's it's like we we're old school friends, Andrew and I, and we've kind of dosed about together our, our entire like adult life as well. So and had a little business and things together, which got us both involved with working with Lindors in the first place. So very good, very good. Go back to Rodrigo for a second. Um, to talk about, uh, I think, uh, the, the Alma Fuerte is kind of this um, cigar which most people are smoking at the moment. Um, so, Alma de Fuerte, Fuerte, Rodrigo, tell me. Yeah, yeah. I'm, first, I'm reading some of, the, uh, some of the comments from the guests tonight, and I'm, I'm really happy that they're enjoying the, the Alma Fuerte. And, and uh, I read a comment that it's one of the best cigars out there. So thank you very much for, for, for enjoying the cigars. Uh, Alma Fuerte is... Um, is our icon, you know, so it's our icon from, from the Placencia lines. Uh, Alma Fuerte means strong soul and is the, the cigar where we use in the most aged tobacco. So um, 10 years plus, and I understand why people enjoy it so much because you, you feel the deepness, you know, on the, on the, on the aging of these tobaccos that we have selected from different regions in, in, in Nicaragua. Some chocolate, some, some coffee, there's a bit of a spiciness, but just subtle. Um, so for us, you know, it's, it's a blend that really represents uh, the heritage of the, of the family. If you see the box of, of the Alma Fuerte, there's um, an old uh, uh, tree that we have in the, in the farm in Esteli, which is a very ancient tree, about 200 years old, uh, not, as, uh, not uh, as old as the family is, but that represents really the roots and, uh, and all the passion that we have for, for the tobacco. So this cigar, which actually was last year was the best cigar of the year, really represents uh, what Placencia uh, means for tobacco and, and, and for the history of, of cigars. You know, in a very short time, uh, we have uh, been blessed to be enjoyed by uh, aficionados around the world. And, and, and the, the good news, you know, is that they're enjoying the work that we do. I, I believe that, uh, you know, over these years, I've been reflecting what's really, you know, what, what's really the most important aspect about Placencia and uh, after six years it comes back to the earth you know and, and going back to the simple things but to be simple you know the family has um, mastered uh, the language uh, of tobacco they know and they understand uh, the plants they know what the plant needs to grow they know when the plant is ready to be harvested they know the exact point when the plant is being cured they have mastered, you know, the fermentation process and also the artists that we have to uh, grow in the tobacco. So I think uh, Placencia for me means tobacco and they have uh, communicated and conversed with tobacco in such a way that we're able to create, uh, for example, the Alma Fuerte. You have now two different, uh, well, two different blends in Alma Fuerte. But now we, we yes, most yeah. people smoke the Robusta now, but they actually, um, Earlier this year, the end of last year, you guys released the, the six to one, uh, which yes. is slightly different blend than than, than the normal Alma Fuerte blend. Uh, absolutely, we we you know so we have uh, the Alma Fuerte in three different vitolas. We have an hexagonal shaped cigar from the Alma Fuerte, which uh, the hexagon for us uh, is, it reflects the honeycomb, which is the the most perfect shape in nature. So we wanted to replicate that into a cigar. Uh, we have also the Robusto, which was the best thing of the year, the one that I'm enjoying tonight, and we have a Toro. But um, uh, we wanted to, let's say, broaden uh, the aficionados who can enjoy Alma Fuerte because Alma Fuerte is a very specific cigar. It's a cigar that usually uh, you enjoy after a nice meal. It's a celebration cigar, but it's not a cigar you usually enjoy in the, in the morning, let's say, on the afternoons. So we wanted to to make this cigar a bit more creamier, lighter, uh, sweeter. So we uh, um, applicate uh, different wrappers. So we're using a Colorado Claro on an hexagonal shaped cigar. So we have the six to one, the six to two. The six to one is the new blend, uh, let's say, using the Colorado, Colorado uh, wrapper. And like you said, Roy, in one of the herbs that we did uh, some months ago, you know, the, the, the Alma Fuerte, with the darker wrapper is an espresso and the, the Alma Fuerte with the Colorado Caro is more like a cafe creme uh, kind of cigar. So we have those uh, two different blends of uh, Alma Fuerte now in the market. 
Are there any other Vitolas coming in the 601 blend that you know of? Or that you can share? Uh, uh, no, we, we're working on a different Vitola. Um, but I cannot say at the moment. So we're working on, let's say, on a, on a more rounded um, tip of, because all of the all of the Alma Fuerte are in box press. So we are working on a rounded uh, Alma Fuerte with the Colorado wrapper, um, wrapper. But not yet, it's not the, in the market. It's a work, working process at the moment. And how about the year of the tiger? You kind of mentioned it uh, earlier on. So that's coming uh, later this year, early next year. So what can yeah, we expect yeah. from that? Yes, um, the year of the tiger. So we're using uh, some of the most aged tobaccos that we have. But for the first time, as I mentioned, the, the family uh, Placencia is the only family growing and making cigars with organic tobacco from two regions until now. But we are releasing for the first time uh, organic tobacco, so natural tobacco from Condega region, which should be uh, released in this uh, uh, year of the tiger plant. So we're really excited to have it. Um, very soon in, in the UK, and hopefully you guys will enjoy it. Uh, the first um, year of the, um, the year of the Ox uh, edition that we did last year was a complete success. So we're hoping that that the, this new blend and uh, this new Toro size that we'll have in the market also will be a, a great success. Good, good. Um, anything else which you can expect? Yeah, as I said, we will have the, the new cosecha in the market uh, at the end of the year. Uh, we are working uh, for next year on, on different vitolas from the different lines uh, uh, that we don't have yet in the market. Uh, we don't expect to present anything new next year. We take time to develop the blends, and uh, we only have very few um, lines in the market. So we, we take really a long time to develop the blends. We are hoping that uh, for aficionados, these blends you know, become classic. So we're trying to to, or our goal is to create new classics in every of the lines that we make. So it takes time uh, to, to find a tobacco, to age a tobacco, to make, to make the blends. So very few things in the market, but uh, for us are very special and hopefully for, for you guys it will also be special. Your collections and your, um, and your enjoyments and the times that you find to smoke the cigar. And then the ocean selection. Yes, 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 yes. We have, we have created, uh, last year we, we had a project with, uh, with, with Mitchell and with Paul, um, which was uh, very successful, and uh, we should have the new blend uh, towards the end of the year as well. So that should be in the UK very soon. Yes. So just to explain uh, to people what that uh, would look like. So um, one will be um, a re-release of the, of the blend we did last year. So just a different, uh, different band, different packaging. Um, and there's going to be a second one, which is a Dominique London edition, um, which will be a Lancero. It's a different blend, uh, but in Lancero format. So uh, that will be uh, that will be something uh, special. Uh, I don't know if you have you tried it. Have I? Uh, yeah. No, no, I haven't. I, oh, haven't, okay. I haven't. I haven't been to Nicaragua in almost two years, so no, I have not. I so, think you have tried it, right? I tried. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's uh, that, that's something uh, something to look forward to, and it's an exclusive uh, for for UK and uh, and Belgium. Yeah, uh, the Cigars Limited uh, merged with uh, with with Dominique uh, into Dominique London, so um, it's going to be exclusive for for Belgium and and the UK. I think there will be uh, three hundred boxes for UK, and then the rest goes to Belgium. So it's definitely something to look forward to. So hopefully, uh, yeah, um, in, in December we can uh, we can welcome that. Uh, those cigars back in uh, for you all to try and then uh, I'm sure we'll do another uh, another session to, to talk about that a little bit more. Absolutely, so, you know we, we, we uh, don't do uh, just a few co branded uh, projects but um, uh, I believe this is a very special one and I hopefully uh, the aficionados will enjoy the plans that we have created uh, for this purpose. I think the, 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 the Vitola is very popular these days, Lancero, I think everybody kind of Falls in love with the Lancero because of its elegant shape and, and size. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure it will be it will be a success. Absolutely. Um, I think that's um, that's it for, for for you today, Rodrigo. We'll quickly switch back to uh, to Murray. You can finish your cigar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for you, kind of the same uh, question, Murray. So, is there anything uh, exciting coming up in the? In, this year or next year, which we really need to look out for? 
Yeah, so I, um, I would say like keep a keep an eye out in the, the close the very close future for the first in the what's called the Casks of Lindor series, um, which will be that um, that sort of spirit and uh, the age exclusively in in bourbon casks uh, in particular. It's uh, old Forester bourbon casks that are being used. So um, we had we had there was a, a really exciting little story of when we were getting access to some of these casks um, from from when I was mentioning Dr. Jim Swan earlier on um, for, the, for the introduction to the, to the sort of the cask supplier we were getting these, these bourbon casks from, it wasn't so much of just pick up a phone and say, yeah, sure, we'll take these casks. It was a, it had to be done with a handshake, an old school kind of meet and greet. So it wasn't just a, like, send an email and say we would like these casks can we have them it was um jim swan was saying to drew and helen you'll have to do this in person and you'll have to do it within the next couple of days and um, so you'll have to jump on a flight and get to kentucky and secure these casks because there was another company that was close to dr jim swan um who he's probably most famous for um was from Cavalan um in taiwan so his message to Drew and Helen was, if you don't win the race, they'll they'll clear them out. So you, you'll need to get to Kentucky within the next couple of days. And so they were like, all right, okay, let's uh, let's book a flight. And they did. They beat the they beat Cavalan to the they beat Cavalan in the race. So it was kind of like a, it was almost like a little um, wacky racers kind of sketch of watching the dotted line going of the little airplane or something going from Scotland and going from <laughs> from Cavaland Distillery to who could who could get there first and thankfully um, Drew and Helen won the race there and were able to secure some of these like impeccable like casks that we're able to use um, which is giving us just fantastic bourbon quality bourbon cask quality to play with there so uh, we, we do we do fill into some um, not to kind of down shoot bourbon cast in any way, but we do fill into some very like different exotic casts as well. Um, that will be some really exciting ones to look out for in the future. Um, there'll be some sort of industry exclusives as well um, from everything from our the, the sort of core range that we do to exciting like little different ones like ex peated Isla casks because we don't we don't use peat um, in the runs at Lindores at all. It's very difficult. We have a, a very good quality new make spirit that we're really happy with. And the, the, the washbacks that we use in the large fermentation vessels, we have traditional Douglas fir wooden washbacks. And our distillery manager, Gary, is, is obviously very, very rightfully so, would be very nervous to do a peated run at our distillery because once you once you do a peated run, it's very difficult to to get back to uh, your, your complete non-peated character that's there. Um, as the, the peat, the peated barley gets into every aspect of all, all of the equipment. Um, so for us to kind of play around with peated expressions comes from ex-peated casks and our, our spirit works really, really well with that as well. So those will be some exciting ones to look out for in the future too. Um, we also have some, we have everything really. There's about 60 or 70 different ca cast styles that we fill into. So everything from like the, the weird and wonderful to your kind of more staple we have in our warehouse and and our spirit is yet to be filled into something that doesn't work with. Sometimes you get some distilleries that'll say this particular type of vessel just doesn't work for us. But our, our new make is very, very versatile and it's it's aging really well in a lot of different cast styles. Um, we also have a, um, like exclusive deal with a bodega um, that's not in the Sherry region, but um, it's our like Amtiago uh, ones from from Montania. Um, we have an exclusive deal with those, so we're filling into not just not just sort of refilled sherries, but um, proper old school like Solera butts that are there. That are the the remnants in the bottom of those casts is almost like treacle. It's proper dark like tar like. So those will be some really exciting casts to look out for in the future as well, and um, something super special there for sure. And how many uh, bottles are normally made in any special releases? Is it one cask? Is it? Um, we do. We do. We we will have some single cask releases. Um, for some of the ones we're doing, like for the Castle Indoors Bourbon, it'll be coming out. 
it'll be in the regions of about 12,000 bottles worldwide. Um, so when you say 12,000 bottles of whiskey, to some people that sounds like a lot, but when you're when you're spreading that across like across the world, it, it's, it, it is a limited run. Um, something that's quite different that we do for our, um, when I say core, it's not, it, it, it's like our, our, our classic one that we have that you have in the wee bottles tonight. We'd obviously, we obviously are a small distillery, so we, we do these in, in small runs, but what we've decided to do with this bottling is to not put batch numbers on these bottles. Um, a lot, a lot of the times, the the bat, the batch numbers we've felt for for some other aspects of other distilleries, they become very, very collectible, um, and people just want to collect the set of batch one, batch two, batch yeah, three, yeah, batch yeah, four, yeah. Uh, and we really want to have people drinking our whiskey, and we're not. Everybody wants that, and everybody is trying to come up with different ways all the time to to make people not to make people drink their whiskey, but to encourage people to actually open the bottles that they purchase. Uh, because there's such a huge secondary market thing for, especially for new young distillery releases. Um, so for for this one here, it will change over time, but that's part of the romance of what whiskey is really. Um, that next year, what's in these bottles that are being filled for this this um, MCDX CIB release, it will change slightly and it will become mature over time, and we just won't be. We won't be pinpointing every single batch that we do for it. If you if people speak to their bottle shops and they ask us, we would be able to tell them this was bottled on at a certain time. So if people are really interested in it, they'll be able to find out. But it's just to try and again take away a little bit of that sole collectability aspect of it. So when I was talking with Paul earlier on there about the, the commemorative bottles that we launched at the start, it was the very same liquid that's in these bottles. From six yards away, the bottles look exactly the same. The commemorative bottles just had a little message down the side that said commemorative first release. And that made these bottles sell out in a couple of hours when they came on, when they came like to market. So again, like a launch of, of 12,000 bottles worldwide would sell out in a day because it says first release. Yeah. Doing just that style of release, you, you might as well fill it with cold tea because so many people won't want to open it because they're part of something of history that's there. And, and I, I, I can't say here nor there to anybody that wouldn't want to open it, that's totally fine, but we wanted to give people the opportunity to drink that liquid and to be part of that. And for anybody who's just in it for the drinking, or uh, it would be exactly the same if it was in the cigar world, I guess. I'm not too sure how collectible cigars are in that in that respect i have to i have to say how i'm a novice in that sense but it would be quite frustrating i'm sure to you all if if every time you released a cigar that it was just being put in the attic and it was never being smoked you know whiskey is the same it, it deserves to be in, in in good company like this and exchanging stories it's it's what it's why we make it and it's what the passion is there for it's why we make good good whiskey so we really want people to open bottles and drink it, but at the same time, can understand why people like to have their, their grown up Pokemon cards at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so. But, but Murray, I, I think uh, se several different independents did what we did is we only sold the commemorative bottle uh, in a pairing <laughs> with the normal release. Yeah. So yeah. that they, they had the opportunity to actually save a bottle, the commemorative release, but yeah. Could open up a bottle and actually taste the actual spirit. Yeah, that, that, that's what was so important to us because it, it's it's one thing. Um, like I look after the sales for the UK, and it's don't get me wrong, it's really exciting to see bottles sell, but it's ten or a hundred times more exciting to see bottles being open and being enjoyed. And somebody posting a bottle on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or something like that of a bottle kill of an empty bottle is 10 times more exciting than somebody say, saying, look at look at what I've got sitting in my cabinet full. For, for us, as, as people who are making the spirit and part of the passion of a young distillery and of a small independent like this, like we're all, every single person that works at, at Lindor's, no matter like what role they play are, nobody is a small cog because everybody plays their part in the family of what Lindor's is. So to see people opening bottles and sharing stories and, putting it into different tastings and it going on to whiskey lists and being involved in restaurants and things is just for us is 
it is an overwhelmingly exciting experience to be part of, to be honest, for a young distillery. So, and and hope and hopefully we become like Lindor's becomes a a, a a sort of name that's that is associated with exceptional quality going forward, and that we become a very um, I don't want to say luxury brand, but a, a brand that's associated with that quality, and it's uh, and it's there there for not just a flash in the pan of. Of, of quick releases that we are become a, a bottle that people can pick up and drink and enjoy and go back to time and time again, which is what's happening. And it, it's, it's brilliant to, to speak to people at shows and on tastings and people will say, oh, you just launched in July, but I'm on my third bottle. You know, that, that's a big deal for the, whis- for the whiskey world. You know, it's not everybody drinks whiskey in the same format as they drink gin, you know, so it's um, especially in the UK and things like that. Anyway, a lot of people... Uh, a lot of people still tr- treat whiskey as a, a very much of a special occasion um, kind of drink, where it's, whereas they might drink eight or ten bottles of gin in a year, they might only drink a couple of bottles of whiskey. Perhaps not in the company we're in tonight, if people are in, in, enjoying like whiskey and cigars on a regular basis. But um, hopefully the demographic of what whiskey is is changing a little bit as well, and people are treating it more as a as a, as a and again, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to encourage people to drink on a regular basis, but uh, whiskey in general is becoming more more approachable to a wider audience of people now, I think. And it's becoming less scary um, for people to go into a whiskey bar or to go into just a, their local pub and to ask a question about whiskey. That's It's becoming much more approachable, I think. And there's there's less stuffiness about it and there's less snobbery about it quite a lot of the time. It's, um, it, that's only a good thing for our industry, and we owe we owe a lot of that to other cultures who have been drinking a lot more Scotch whisky than Scotch people have. That's for sure. So, and um, and that trend of how how people drink it in other parts of the world are starting to come now into into Scotland, into the UK, and like high ball serves, for example, is a is a nice lighter way to enjoy a good quality whisky, um, but have it in a bit more of a refreshing format, things like that. So. I think our I think our whiskies have got great great complexity and great legs to 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 walk into lots of different environments as well. So, do you guys have plans to make a distillery edition? Yeah, you so buy at the distillery. Yeah, absolutely. So we're we're actually just in the process um, of we'll be releasing sort of three distillery exclusives um, of of three individual casks that will be coming out uh, very soon. They'll only be available to purchase from the distillery. And they won't be online or anything like that. It'll just be people who visit the distillery will have the option to purchase those bottles, which will be really exciting. Um, and we'll have some other sort of market exclusives too. And um, people who are involved in cask ownership, for example, um, everybody has their own little pocket of little bonuses that they have if they're part of the membership society, if they're part of their, like, as a young distillery, something we did as well was was allow private cask ownership at Lindor's. So people get into little syndicates with friends or themselves for for, for any particular reason. We don't um, advise people on like investment purposes. Yeah, sure. we're, we're not we're not uh, we're not investment like management people or anything like that. So we, we don't try and pull the wool over anybody's eyes of like you know there's lots of adverts out in the world will say that if you know buy a cask and you know a you'll make millions of it in the future. We don't do anything like that. We we, we have Elliot with Higgins, who is our, has probably the, the finest name of um, any role in the whiskey industry, which is our cask custodian at Lindor's Abbey Distillery. Uh, it's a class, a, a real class title that he's got. But Elliot will talk people through the full ins and outs of owning your own cask and what, what you can do with that liquid once it becomes of age and things. And again, that's... That, that's a different avenue for some people to go down, but it's it's really exciting to see these people, like families and friends, get so excited about coming to see their own cask and what they can do with it when it's finished as well. So good. There's a lot of fireworks going on behind me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's the same here. It's the same here. So. <laughs> okay. So I'm but Murray, we, we we should talk about doing a cigar malt. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. For sure. So select a, a single cask and uh, let's label it up as a cigar malt. We'll yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be more than happy to have that conversation. And you guys heard it here first. So uh, it could be the fact that I've 
I'm halfway through a cigar there, uh, and I've had a few malts that I'm agreeing to on the spot, but yeah, 100%. <laughs> Well, we've got a few witnesses now, so yeah. yeah, that's it, and it's a recorded session there, so uh, you know, it's it, it's in the world now. We'll do something in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always quite earlier this week, so yeah, when I'm uh, next up in uh, in Creekway, I'll uh, I'll come your way and visit the distillery. So. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. that'd be fantastic. And it's it's been great as well because um, um, like some of the, the the stories that you've been speaking about the the stars tonight and things as well, like uh. I had the real pleasure of uh, a number of years back doing a lot of traveling in Central America and visiting. Um, at the time, I, I didn't foresee my, myself working in the whiskey industry and doing cigar pairings, or I would have visited uh, um, cigar factories and things when I was there. But uh, I very much enjoyed my visit to, to Nicaragua and things when I was out there. So it's been... Where did you go to Nicaragua? Um, just very much the kind of backpacker tourist trail that was there so again it was a uh, living on a shoestring scenario so it was uh j- just your just your, your usual sort of um coastal beach spots and things like that so but it was be- beautiful part of the world and i'd like to, i'd like to go back there now and you know i, I still i think I, I brought back as much for the canyon rum as i possibly could when i was there and, uh, <laughs> and uh, so I, i'd like i'd like to go back and um as someday a little bit with a more mature head on me and it not just yeah, yeah, be about yeah, yeah. Uh, picking up a good suntan and um it's and definitely drink. worth it it's yeah, definitely worth sure. it you are more than welcome to come and visit us Murray anytime that would be fantastic again I'll hold you to that it's in the recording too you see so. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely you know, and I couldn't agree more with what you said about uh, uh, the beautiful thing that we do you know we, we make cigars to get people together to bring a smile on the face to open up great conversations uh, to commemorate and celebrate that great occasion so that I couldn't agree more with you that the products that we create, you know, and the, the art that we create is to be enjoyed. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Perfect. Right. I think we uh, we came to the end of our, our session uh, this evening. So uh, thank you, uh, Rodrigo, for dialing in from uh, from Spain and talking about uh, Placentia and uh, and what's coming up, which is always very exciting. And Murray, the same. Well, thank you for, for logging in and telling us uh, the story of uh, Lindora's uh, distillery. Um, as I said, I'll, I'll definitely come and visit next time I'm up that, uh, that way. And uh, hopefully more people who have been uh, on the call uh, will also show an interest in, in doing something similar. So, uh, so thank you all. Paul, same as always. Thank Much you. For appreciate it. Thanks, Roy. Everyone. And uh, the session was recorded. So... Um, it will go up on the uh, Cigars uh, YouTube channel at some point. So there's no backtracking from Murray on the cigar mode. <laughs> <laughs> and it also I'm, goes I'm for Rodrigo, you know, you're know, you very welcome in Nicaragua, so you can play it back and uh, yeah. say the words. So. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, right. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the week. Much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Slash. Cheers. Slash.